Hey, babe. How you doing? I miss you, too. I wish we didn't have to be apart for this long. How are you doing? Not great, huh? Well, have you played any games lately that um, bring you joy? No? What? No. Please tell me they didn't do that. <sighs> Why? Why do adults have to boomer so hard? No, you are not useless because you play video games. No, you are not a parasite because you live at home. I think the numbers are 50% of people under 25 still live with their parents. This is pretty normal right now. What? No, oh, no, no. God, you sound like a capitalist. But reducing yourself down to some sort of measurement of outcome. Are you a widget maker? Have you been to an economic class recently that said <laughs> you only have value as a some sort of machine to serve society? Oh, love. Shh, shh, shh. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I'm here. I'm here. You are not useless. Well, and just hearing your voice brings me joy. That's what humans are for, right? To connect. No. Okay, so let's imagine your friend has a pet. And this pet is suddenly kind of not playing. Maybe not eating. Doesn't seem interested in some of the things they used to do. Doesn't really move a lot. Would we say that that pet is bad? That they're somehow lacking? That we should take away their toys because they don't deserve them? Of course not. <laughs> we would take them to the vet. We would try to figure out if they're okay. We would be worried about them. We would be looking at the environment, right? To figure out why this animal is suffering. Newsflash, um, you're an animal. Yeah, yeah. Well, what in your environment is part of this? You do not live in a vacuum. No. Of course not. No. Say it for me. Say, I am not worthless. Don't make me pull out the Dom card, because I will. Say, I am not worthless, Miss Wendy. A good girl. Okay, this one's going to be a hard one, but since you're being such a stubborn brat, I want you to say, Hmm, I have value, Miss Wendy. Say, say it. Say it. Again. <laughs> okay. This could be a really fun game, you know. I just <laughs> make you say things that are true. True like gravity. You have value, of course. Of course. Well, I mean, we aren't here to simply make other people rich that seems silly I think we're here to kind of I don't know be alive to experience life to connect to know people and feel the sun on our face and feel joy and feel struggle and to experience well you're not just here to serve other people, cutie. Well, I, I really do enjoy when you serve me. Of course. <laughs> of course I do, baby girl. But that's not why you're here. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> I wish I could reach through this phone and give you the biggest hug ever. 
Maybe wrap you up in a blanket. Put your head in my lap. Boop your nose with your lobes. Maybe read to you. Hmm? Would you like that if I read to you? Well, I'm in the middle of a book. I could just read to you what I'm reading. Okay. And how about you lay down? Be a good girl and lay down. Find a spot. Get all snuggly. Maybe grab one of your stuffies and squeeze them. Mm -hmm. well, how about you get a heavy blanket? and put it over you, like uh, make it into a, a tube shape and put it over your middle. You can pretend it's my arm. Hmm? That's what I do with my weighted blanket when you're not around. <laughs> yeah? Of course, I miss you. Of course. So yes, I snuggle my pillow and throw a weighted blanket over my <laughs> side so it feels like I'm not alone. And sometimes I tuck a pillow in behind me so it feels like you're the big spoon. Sometimes I pretend I'm the big spoon and you're the little spoon. Mm-hmm. Snuggling you is the best. It's the best. And it brings us mutual joy, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. So you get all snuggly. And I know I'm far away. I know I'm not there with you, right? I want you to close your eyes and know you aren't alone. You're surrounded by so many other humans that are all probably struggling and doubting and hurting and hopefully finding joy and laughter and connection and purpose, but also just people. You're not alone. You have value. <laughs> you are worthy. And now I want you to relax. Take a deep breath in through your nose, like you're um, sniffing a flower. <laughs> and then hold it for me. Hold it, be good. And now blow it out like, um, like you're blowing out very, very many, um, like you're blowing out the candles on your grandma's birthday cake, ready? Uh-huh. Well, hopefully you were blowing it out because I got distracted by explaining it. Okay. No, you done? Okay, take another deep breath in through your nose. <laughs> and then hold it. Hold it or I'll tickle you. All the way out. One more time. Maybe I baked you something. Smell it. <laughs> Your favorite cookies. <laughs> and then hold it. You want to hold that good smell in? Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Good girl. Now blow. Now be with me and listen. Mm, it's around here somewhere. Well, I found a bookstore locally. Keep your eyes closed. It's a used bookstore. And I found an old book. Yeah. The one the YouTube gods won't get mad at me for reading to you. <laughs> that fourth wall, huh? Well, how about I start at the beginning, huh? I'm not going to tell you what it is. Well, there was a movie based on this recently. And I think there was a classic. I'm not going to read you the list of characters because that would give it away. Your job is to focus and try to figure out what story. 
Oh, I'm not even going to give you the name of the chapter because that would be too many hints and you are too smart for your own good. So, shh, shh, shh. close your eyes again, little one. <laughs> okay. It was five o'clock on a winter's morning in the Syria alongside the platform at Alapu stood the train grandly designated in railway guides as the Taurus Express. It consisted of a kitchen and a dining car and a sleeping car and two local coaches. By the step leading up into the sleeping car stood a young French lieutenant resplendent in uniform, conversing with a small man, muffled up to the ears of whom nothing was visible but a pink-tipped nose, I would boop it, and the two points of an upward-curled moustache. It was freezingly cold, and this job of seeing off a distinguished stranger was not one to be envied, but the lieutenant performed his part manfully. Graceful phrases fell from his lips in polished French, not that he knew what it was all about. And there had been rumors, of course, as there always were in such cases. The general's, well, his general's temper had grown worse and worse. And then there had come this Belgian stranger, all the way from England, it seemed. There had been a week, a week of curious intensity, and then certain things had happened. A very distinguished officer had committed suicide. Another had suddenly resigned. Anxious faces had suddenly lost their anxiety. Certain military precautions were relaxed. And the general, the lieutenant's own particular general, had suddenly looked ten years younger. He had overheard part of a conversation between him and the stranger. You have saved us, mon cher, said the general emotionally, his great white moustache trembling as he spoke. You have saved the honor of the French army. You have averted much bloodshed. How can I thank you for acceding to my request? To have come so far, to which the stranger had made a fitting reply, including the phrase, But indeed, do I not remember that once you saved my life? And then the general had made another fitting reply to that, disclaiming any merit for the past service, and with more mention of France, of Belgium, of glory, of honor, and of such kindred things they had embraced each other heartily, and the conversation had ended. As to what it had all been about, the lieutenant was still in the dark, but to him had been delegated the duty of seeing off this human, whose name I'm not telling you, because I think you'll get it if I do. So I'm going to be a brat. It had been his duty to see off this human on the Taurus Express, and he was carrying it out with all the zeal and ador befitting a young officer with a promising career ahead of him. Today is Sunday, said the lieutenant. Tomorrow, Monday evening, you will be in Stamboul. I might be saying that wrong. Well, you know geography is not my strong suit. It was not the first time he had made this observation. Conversations on the platform before the departure of a train were apt to be somewhat repetitive in character. That so, agreed the man. And you intend to remain there a few days, I think? Oh, we, oui, we. Oui. Istanbul is a city I have never visited. It would be a pity to pass through. He snapped his fingers descriptively. 
nothing presses. I shall remain there as a tourist for several days. La Sainte Sophie is very fine, said the lieutenant, who had never seen it. A cold wind came whistling down the platform. Both men shivered. The lieutenant managed to cast a serotipitous glance at his watch. Five minutes to five, only five minutes to go. Fancying that the other man had noticed his glance, he hastened once more into speech. There are several people traveling this time of year, he said, glancing up at the windows of the sleeping car above them. That is so, agreed the man. Let us hope you will not have been snowed up in the Taurus. That happens? Yes, it occurs. Not this year as yet. Let us hope then, said the man. The weather reports from Europe, they are bad, very bad in the Balkans. There is much snow. Oh, in Germany, too, I have heard. Oh, eh bien, said the lieutenant, hastily as another pause seemed to be about to occur. Tomorrow evening at 7.40, you will be in Constantinople. Yes, said the man, and went on desperately. La Sainte Sophie, I have heard, is a very fine, magnificent, I believe. Above their heads... The blinds of one of the sleeping compartments was pushed aside as a young woman looked out. Mary Deppenham had had little sleep since she left Baghdad on the preceding Thursday, neither in the train to Kirk nor at the rest house in Mosul, nor last night in the train had she slept properly. Now, weary of lying wakeful in the hot stuffiness of her overheated compartment, she got up and peered out. I hope you're not overheated. This must be Aleppo. Nothing to see, of course. Just a long, poorly lighted platform with loud, furious altercations in Arabic going on somewhere. Two men below her window were talking in French. One was a French officer. The other was a little man with an enormous moustache. She smiled faintly. She had never seen anyone quite so heavily muffled up. It must be very cold outside. There. That was why they heated the train so terribly. She tried to force the window down lower, but it would not go. The wagon lit conductor had come up to the two men. The train was about to depart, he said. Mon jour had better mount. The little man removed his hat. What an egg-shaped head he had. In spite of her preoccupations, Mary Debenham smiled. A ridiculous-looking little man. The sort of little man one could never take seriously. The lieutenant was saying his parting speech. He had thought it out beforehand had kept it till the last minute. It was a very beautiful, polished speech. Not to be outdone, <laughs> the man replied in kind, and bonjour, monsieur. <laughs> I'm going to brutal this friend. Are you ready? Hopefully my brutaling doesn't keep you awake, baby girl. Just smile at the folly of me reading you an old book with big words. Shh, no teasing. Envoy toi, monsieur, said the wagon lit conductor. With an air of infinite reluctance, the man climbed aboard the train. The conductor climbed after him, and then the man waved his hand. The lieutenant came to the salute. The train, with a terrific jerk, moved slowly forward. Fun, murmured the man. Burr, the lieutenant said, realizing to the full how cold he was. Voila, monsieur, the conductor displayed to the man with a dramatic gesture the beauty of his sleeping compartment and the neat arrangement of his luggage. The little valise of monsieur, I have put it here. His outstretched hand was suggestive. The man placed in it a folded note. Merci, monsieur. The conductor became brisk and businesslike. I have 
tickets of Montjuïc. I will also take the passport, please. Montjuïc breaks his journey in Istanbul. I understand. The man assented. There are not so many people traveling, I imagine. He said, "No, Montjuïc. I have only two other passengers, both English, a colonel from India, and a young English woman from Baghdad." Monsieur requires anything? Monsieur demanded a small bottle of Perrier. I didn't know that company was that old. Yes, it's an old book. Five o'clock in the morning is an awkward time to board a train. There are still two hours before dawn. Conscious of an inadequate night's sleep and of a delicate mission successfully accomplished, the man curled up in a corner and fell asleep. When he awoke, it was half past nine, and he sallied forth to the restaurant car in search of hot coffee. There was only one occupant at the moment, obviously the young English lady referred to by the conductor. She was tall, slim, and dark, perhaps twenty-eight years of age. Ooh la la. There was a kind of cool efficiency in the way she was eating her breakfast and in the way she called to the attendant to bring her more coffee, which bespoke of a knowledge of the world and of traveling. She wore a dark colored traveling dress of some thin material, eminently suitable for the heated atmosphere of the train. The man, whose name I'm not telling you, having nothing better to do, amused himself by studying her without appearing to do so. She was, he judged, the kind of young woman who would take care of herself with perfect ease wherever she went. She had poise and efficiency. He rather liked the severe efficiency of her features and the delicate pallor of her skin. He liked the burnished black head with its neat waves of hair and her eyes, cool, impersonal, and gray. But she was, he decided, just a little too efficient for what he liked to call jolie femme. I'll have to look up these words later. Presently, another person entered the restaurant car. This was a tall man of between 40 and 50, lean of figure, brown of skin, with hair slightly grizzled around the temples. The colonel from India, the man thought to himself. The newcomer gave a little bow to the girl. A morning, Miss Debbingham. Good morning, Colonel Abernot. The colonel was standing with his hand on the chair opposite her. Any objections? he asked. Oh, of course not. Sit down. Well, you know, breakfast isn't always a chatty meal. I should hope not, but I don't bite. The colonel sat down. Boy, he called in a peremptory fashion. He gave an order for eggs and coffee. His eyes rested for a moment on the man, but they passed on indifferently. The man, reading the English mind correctly, knew that he had said to himself, only some damned foreigner. True to their nationality, the two English people were not chatty. They exchanged a few brief remarks, and presently the girl rose and went back to her compartment. At lunchtime, the other two again shared a table, and again they completely ignored the third passenger. Their conversation was more animated than at breakfast. Colonel uh, Arbuthnot, I think I said it wrong before, although I still could talked of the Punjab and occasionally asked the girl a few questions about Baghdad where it became clear she had been in a post as governess. In the course of conversation, they discovered some mutual friends, which had the immediate effect of making them more friendly and less stiff. They discussed old Tom somebody and old Reggie something else. The colonel inquired whether she was going straight through to England or whether she was stopping in Istanbul. No, no, I'm going straight on. Oh, isn't that rather a pity? Oh, I should have been using accents. That would be fun. No, I'm going straight on. Oh, isn't that rather a pity? I came out this way two years ago and spent three days in Istanbul then. Oh, I see. Well, I may say I'm very glad you are going right through. 
because I am. He made a kind of clumsy little bow, flushing a little as he did so. He is susceptible, our colonel, thought the man to himself with some amusement. The train is as dangerous. The train is as dangerous as the sea voyage. Miss Debenham said evenly that that would be very nice. Her manner was slightly repressive. Those British people. <laughs> the colonel, the man noticed, accompanied her back to her compartment. Oh, my. Later they passed through the magnificent scenery of the Taurus as they looked down toward the Sicilian gates, standing in the corridor side by side. A sigh came suddenly from the girl. The man was standing near them and heard her murmur, It's so beautiful, I wish, I wish, yes, I wish I could enjoy it. Arbuthnot did not answer. The square line of his jaw seemed a bit sterner and grimmer. I wish to heaven you are out of all this, he said. Oh, hush, please hush. Oh, it's all right. He shot a slightly annoyed glance in the man's direction. Then he went on. But I don't like the idea of your being a governess at the beck and call of tyrannical mothers and their tiresome brats. She laughed with just a hint of uncontrol at the sound. Oh, you mustn't think that. The downtrodden governess is quite an exploded myth. I can assure you that it's the parents who are afraid of being bullied by me. They said no more. Abarthnot was perhaps ashamed of his outburst. Rather an odd little comedy I watch here, said the man to himself thoughtfully. He was to remember the thought of this later. They arrived at Konya that night about half past eleven. The two English travelers got out to stretch their legs, pacing up and down the snowy platform. The man was content to watch the teeming activity of the station through the window pane. After about ten minutes, however, he decided that a breath of air would not perhaps be a bad thing after all. He made careful preparations, wrapping himself in several coats and bufflers and encasing his neat boots in galoshes. Thus attired, he descended gingerly to the platform and began to pace its length. He walked out beyond the engine. It was the voices which gave him the clue to the two indistinct figures standing in the shadow of the traffic van. Aberthnot was speaking. Mary. The girl interrupted. Mary, the girl interrupted him. Not now, not now. When it's all over, when it's behind us, then. Discreetly, the man turned away. He wondered. He would hardly have recognized the cool, efficient voice of Miss Debernam. Curious, he said to himself. The next day, he wondered whether perhaps they had quarreled. They spoke so little to each other. The girl, he thought, looked anxious. There were dark circles under her eyes. It was about half past two in the afternoon when the train came to a halt. Heads were poking out of windows. A little knot of men were clustered by the side of the line, looking and pointing at something under the dining car. The man leaned out and spoke to the wagon lid conductor who was hurrying past. The conductor answered, and the man drew back his head and turning, almost collided with Mary Debenham, who was standing just behind him. What is the matter? She asked rather breathlessly in French. Why are we stopping? Oh, it's nothing, mademoiselle. It is something that is caught under the dining car. Nothing serious. It is put out. They are now repairing the damage. There is no danger, I assure you. She made a little abrupt gesture as though she were waving the idea of danger aside as something completely unimportant. Yes, yes, I understand that, but the time. The time? Yes, this will delay us. It is possible, yes, agreed the man. Oh, but we can't afford delay. This train is due at 6.55, and the other has to cross the Brospos and catch the Zeppelin Orient Express on the other side at 9 o'clock. If there is an hour or two of delay, we shall miss the connection. Oh, it is very possible, he admitted. He looked at her curiously. The hand that held the window bar was not quite steady. Her lips, too, were trembling. 
Does it matter to you very much, mademoiselle? He asked. Oh, yes, yes, it does. I, I must catch that train. She turned away from him and went down the corridor to join Colonel Arbuthnot. Her anxiety, however, was needless. Ten minutes later, the train started again. It arrived at the next station only five minutes late, having made up time in the journey. The Bosporus was rough, and the man did not enjoy the crossing. He was separated from the traveling companions on the boat and did not see them again. On arrival at the Galata Bridge, he drove straight to the Tolcana Hotel. Chapter 2 the hotel. Dun, dun, dun. Are you asleep? Hmm? <laughs> I don't know if you're sleeping. So I'll tell you what. I'm going to stay right here on the line listening to you breathe. And I'm just going to be with you because I miss you. So I'm just going to type and get some work done. And if you wake up, I'll be here. You are worthy, love. Don't let anybody make you doubt that.
And this audio was brought to you by my Patreon. Thank you, my good girls, for making all this possible.